really want to comment on individual kits claims or anything like that, but I want to give some context to what it is that they might be operating on. So give you a, a history of, of human genetics and to explain why, how they might work. Um, this is an old issue though. So back in 2010, before those kits were available, you could still get DNA testing kits. Um, this one here in the main screen, um, the warrior gene uh, is an infamous one. Um, it was one of the first DNA testing uh, sampling kits that was available. For $99, they would just test one gene. And the science on which this is based, the idea that if you have this particular variant of the gene, it would make you, I don't know, good at sports, more likely to become a Viking or just very cross in this case. I think, I think the idea is that you're a go-getting sort of person if you have the warrior gene. But the thing is, everybody has the warrior gene um, because it's, and it's not called the warrior gene. Um, but it gives you an example of the sorts of hype that you can see in these sorts of kits. And unfortunately, it's not gone away. Uh, as I said, I don't generally comment on the kits, but I'm happy to comment on this kit. If th this kit is just, again, it's a modern one, still around today, um, that again, only focuses on one gene and is absolutely not worth the money <laughs> at all. Um, the science on which it's based is flimsy at best. Um, so this is not 23andMe or Ancestry, but these kits are still around. Um, and this is possibly the future. OK, so we, we are aware in human genetics of the ability to do large scale screens to look for genetic variation that it is, is associated with some of the things that is on here. So, for instance, risk of Alzheimer's, risk of breast cancer, stroke. IQ, baldness, all of these things have a genetic contribution to them. Uh, and so the implication, this is taken from an article in The Economist, the implication is that we might be able to test in vitro, we might be able to test in through in vitro fertilization and select babies or select specifically embryos that were more likely to have a high IQ. And this, this is just science fiction and may well may never well come to pass because the accuracy of these predictions for reasons that I really don't want to go into um, that, that would be a lecture series in itself the accuracy of these pre pre predictions are not what they're set out to be uh, often in the popular press so after having sort of thrown cold water on it what what am I going to set out to do I'm going to tell you about the human genome what it is uh, how you have inherited it, and, and what the sorts of things that we can do. And so as a counteract, to, to counteract the, the hyperbole of this slide, I want to give you this one. This is 23andMe, and this is what 23andMe can accurately tell you. So for instance, it can tell you, based on genetics, whether you have wet, sticky earwax, or whether you have dry or flaky earwax. But I suspect you could probably stick your finger in your ear and find that out for yourself without doing a genetic test. But the reasons why you might have wet sticky earwax or dry flaky earwax is grounded in solid genetics and in fact is grounded solidly in the history of your genome. So what are we going to talk about? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that you are a mosaic. Uh, I talk about the genome. I should perhaps explain what I mean by a genome. So the human genome has 20,000 genes. That's the collection of genes that are required to build a person. Um, th those are carried on chromosomes. Those genes are carried on chromosomes. Chromosome 1 is the largest. Uh, chromosome Y is the smallest. These, uh, this is a nice illustration from the artist Gina Glover. These actually aren't chromosomes, they're socks, but they're socks arranged to look like chromosomes. And they, they more or less accurately depict the, the sizes of the chromosomes. Um, so there are 22 uh, what we call autosomes. These are the chromosomes that are not involved uh, in sex determination. 
And then there's the X chromosome uh, and the Y chromosome, the Y chromosome determining maleness. And there's another thing that's not shown on here because it would be too tiny to be represented. And that's the mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed on by mothers to their offspring. So you're a fragment, you're a fragmentary mosaic. Your genome consists of 47 segments. Okay, you have one set of segments from your mother and one set of segments from your father. So if we now zoom in in detail, let's have a look at what's happening at the individual chromosome level. I can hear that there are questions popping up, but I, I hope that somebody's able to monitor them. Good. I don't can't. worry, don't worry, I'm on it. <laughs> Perfect. So um, let's look at a simple case where we're looking at chromosome, a single chromosome, not the entire set of chromosomes. So you, this may not be a groundbreaking to you, you will have inherited, for every chromosome, you will have inherited one copy from your mum, one copy from your dad. And the important thing is that when, when your mum your mum's got two chromosomes that she could pass on to you. Your dad has two chromosomes that he could pass on to you. But more importantly, in the process of deciding which one they're going to pass on, they mix and match these versions. Sometimes they can pass on an unmixed version. Sometimes they can pass on a mixed version, like this one for here, for instance, where um, this, perp this light purple chromosome has been snipped here and here. And that piece has been moved onto its partner, uh, and its partner's piece has been moved onto itself. This is what we call a recombinant chromosome, and it's an absolutely important feature of how we make eggs and sperm. So what that means is that you could get a chromosome from your mum, which is unmixed up. But you could get a chromosome from your dad, like this one is shown here, which is mixed up. So basically what's happened is your dad in this case has taken one, one chromosome, that the chromosome that he, he got from, say, his mum, and the chromosome that he got from his dad, and so mixed them up. Whereas in this case, your mum has passed on the chromosome whole. And let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So this, this illustration comes from a, a proper human geneticist called Graham Coop. And what he's doing here is he's simulating a human genome. He said, this is your genome. It's obviously not your genome, but it's notionally your genome. It's what your genome could look like, looking only at chromosomes 22 all the way to the larger chromosome 1. So X and Y are not on here. The, the things that are shaded purple are the, the regions that your mum has passed on to you. The things that are not shaded, those are the regions that your dad has passed on to you. So if we zoom in, we can see, for instance, on chromosome 16, your mum has passed on chromosome 16 to you. Um, but what we, we can also do in this simulation is we can go backwards from your mum to look into your, your maternal grandmother. And in this particular case, what we can see is by chance, your mum has passed on intact the whole of chromosome 16 that she she inherited from her dad your grandfather uh, which means that your your maternal grandmother has passed on no chromosome 16 to you so your maternal grandmother from your chromosome 16 status has made no contribution to you if we look at say chromosome 22 on the other hand this is the stretch that your mother has passed on to you and this we can see in your maternal grandmother, she has passed on to you both copies. So through your mother, she's passed on the, the, her, the copies that she got from her dad and the copy that she got from her mum, mix them up. And so those are the ones that you've inherited. See, genomes are fragmentary. You're a mosaic. These splices or, or cutting events that we see, on average, uh, your parents will make about 71 such splices. So that if we go back one generation like we have, um, you'll, you'll inherit about 118 pieces. Okay. So what I'm going to do in this is now go backwards. We're going to watch your genome explode as it goes backwards. So going back one generation to your parents, 
that gets turned into so your intact gen, uh, genome comes from about 118 genome segments. If you go back two generations, so your grandparents, now your genome is segmented into 189 pieces. Okay. As we go back further, each time we go back, the, what, what's happening is you're doubling the number of ancestors and your genome is becoming more and more fragmented. Okay. So for instance, by the time you get 10 generations back, okay, so th approximately 300 years ago, what we'll find is that a substantial number of your ancestors have not contributed any DNA to you at all, okay? Because you've got 757 fragments spread over 1,024 ancestors. So by definition, there aren't enough ancestors anymore to each have contributed enough to you. So some of these, they're, they're your genealogical ancestors, but they are not your genetic ancestors at all. 15 generations back, so 450 years, uh, you've now got 32,768 ancestors, but only 1,112 segments. So in fact, the calculations show this far back, 15 generations ago, only 3% of your ancestors will have contributed to you genetically. They are your genealogical ancestors, but only a tiny fraction of them will have, have, have transmitted DNA down the generations to you. But there's something even more shocking in tracing your ancestry back in time. So as we move back through a pedigree, as we've seen, the number of ancestors is growing. And as we move back in time, though, there are fewer and fewer people around to be your ancestors. So in theory, if we were to go back 35 generations, so that's a, a thousand years or so, there should be, with the ancestors increasing, there should be on average between 30, about 34 billion ancestors. Now, I, I think you can probably work out why that's a problem. Um, there certainly weren't that many people alive back then. So what's going on here is something called pedigree collapse. Now, genealogists know all about this. So if there are any genealogists in the audience, this, now's the time to go to sleep because I won't be telling you anything remarkable. So this is another one of Graham Coop's uh, simulations. So this is a simulated pedigree um, of a, a population of a thousand individuals uh, where we're focused on one particular person. So this could be you, for instance. And this is the parents of that individual and going back in time. And this simulation goes back through the generations and it draws an open circle um, on individ individuals that appear in the pedigree more than once. So by the time we get back to the 10th generation, we see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six individuals which appear more than once in this person's pedigree. So this is what we call pedigree collapse. In other words, um, there are more, there's more than one route from you to these individuals going through these, th this lineage. So this is effect, this is inbreeding, okay? By 15 generations back, right at the top here, you can see that this is a solid line, okay? So by 15 generations back, a substantial number of the ancestors appear more than once in your pedigree. Some of these individuals are appearing seven, seven times in the pedigree. To show this even in more detail, we can overlay the pedigrees of two individuals. So now the open circles represent situations where we have ancestors of the blue individual, which are also ancestors of the red individual. Okay, so nine generations back in this sim simulation, we encounter two individuals. But that are the ancestors of this person and this person. But this is a simulation of a thousand people per generation. You're right to say, yeah, but this is not real. So what is real? So what is real is because we have the genome sequences of thousands of individuals, we can actually test whether these simulations represent accurate genealogy. And it turns out that if you have European ancestry, going back through all our pedigrees, we reach a time around about the 13th century. 
when our pedigrees confer, converge on the same person. So if you have European, substantial European ancestry, as I do, by the 13th century, all of you and me have the same common ancestor. Okay, now this isn't, this isn't sort of a hypothetical notion. This is reality. By the 13th century, we've arrived at the point where somebody alive then is the ancestor of all of us. You guys at home, me in this office. Okay, so we will still have other ancestors that we don't share in common though. Two people with Scottish ancestry, for instance, will have more common ancestors in common than either would with somebody with Spanish ancestry. But nevertheless, they will all have that same common ancestor alive in the 13th century. But things get even more edifying as we go further back in time. So by the 10th century, if you remember a few slides back, I said that you would theoretically have 34 billion ancestors or thereabouts. But I said that, that there weren't that many people alive in the world at the time. We estimate that there was about 300 million max globally and only about 50 million in Europe. So what this means because of pedig pedigree collapse is that if you have European ancestry, as I do, then by the 10th century, all of your ancestors, you guys sitting watching this, all of your ancestors by the 10th century are identical to mine. OK, let that sink in. You can pick anybody in the 10th century and they will be by definitively your ancestor, provided that they left descendants. Now, that's about 80 percent of all 10th century European population. So by the 10th century, everybody alive in Europe at the time, if they left descendants, is the ancestor of everybody in Europe. With, ancestry, with European ancestry alive today. So if you have European ancestry, one of the more interesting people alive in the 10th century was Abdel al-Rahman III, the Caliph of Cordoba. This guy is your direct ancestor. He's mine too. So we can take this analysis outside of Europe and we end up with even more startling conclusions. So Douglas Rhodes, Steve Olson and Joseph Chang showed some time ago that that everybody's recent common ancestor, that is the person who shows up in the pedigrees of everybody alive today, only lived about two to 5,000 years ago. Now that's, that's startlingly recent, okay? Their analysis showed that about 6,000 years ago, there are some error bars on this, so between six to 8,000 years ago, everybody alive then in the world, if they left descendants, is the ancestor of everybody alive today. Again, that, that is one of these things that people, when I give these presentations, when I give it live, you can see the skepticism on everybody's faces because we're used to thinking that, that, that we, we've been isolated, that human populations have been isolated for so long. And, and in the bulk, that is true. But what happens, what, what, uh, what Road, Olson and Chang showed was that populations nevertheless have leaky boundaries. And if you have those leaky boundaries and expand them across the planet, you find that there are no populations or very, very few that have been isolated for extended periods of time. We, the, our ancestral network is a mesh. We're all much more closely related genealogically than is commonly appreciated. And as we've built up more and more data looking at this, the genetics has validated this, this picture, which I'm showing you here, which, which came from the mathematics of population genetics. The actual raw data has validated this. Um, and I'm going to come on to give you some examples of that in a minute. But these are genealogical ancestors, okay? I've already told you, if you go so far back in time, most of the people that are your genuine genealogical ancestors haven't contributed any D DNA to you. I think it's famously said that the, 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 the late Queen Elizabeth II uh, was related to, to William the Conqueror. And because she's royalty, there's a clear genealogical link to her. To, to, to William the Conqueror 
William Conqueror will not have contributed any DNA. The likelihood of that is very is vanishingly small. So what are we what let's look at genetic ancestry. Okay, so one of the simplest things we can do is we can look at mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondrial DNA, remember, is the DNA that is passed on by, on, on to, by mothers to their children. Their children will only pass on the mitochondrial DNA if they're, if they're female. So we, we have this tree that builds up tracking a particular mitochondrial DNA from this ancestral mother here all the way through in this simplified case to say to today. So this is a simplified, simplified picture, but the reality is, is that that is what we see. So everybody alive today has mitochondrial DNA, which we can trace back to one particular individual, so-called mitochondrial Eve. Now she wasn't the only person, unlike the biblical Eve, she wasn't the only woman alive. She was one of many, but she's the only woman who we can trace all our mitochondria to. The, many of the other women who were alive at the time produced mitochondria which have not survived, such as this magenta case here, to today. Uh, and so that's what we mean when we talk about mitochondrial Eve. It's true we can trace our, our lineage back to this one particular person. We know when and approximately where she lived. We, she lived about 200,000 years ago and she lived in Africa very precise, but that's this is as best as we're going to do. But this is only one segment of your genetic code. Remember I said that you're a mosaic, so we can look at all the other segments. So for each segment in your genome, you've got one version from your mother and one version from your father, as I said. And in most cases, those different versions will look different the order of letters, the DNA code that makes up our genetic code will be slightly different. On average, comparing your mother's version to your father's version, we expect to find differences, one difference about every thousand letters. Okay, that's shown here. So there are two segments here that I've shown here. This segment here on the left has differences that I've shown here. The letters of DNA can be abbreviated to GTCA. Okay, and that's all you really need to know for this. So there are four letters. And in this case, your mother has a G at that position and your father has an A there. And then several thousand nucleotides along, we find that your mother has a T there and your father a C there. These differences may not have, in fact, most of the time they have no consequences, but they do allow us to date these different segments of DNA, because the more differences there are, the older they are, because the, 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 greater the, the greater they've been separated from one another compared to their common ancestor. So this segment over here is younger compared to this segment over here. And I'm going to hopefully explain what I mean by that by use of a, a tree metaphor. So by looking at these differences and knowing the mutation rate, that we have for humans and, and putting in a few other uh, factors that we, we can infer about the way genetic codes work in people, we can trace these things back in time. So for this segment, let's have a look at this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, this is now, um, we're gonna trace back this segment. And what we would do on average, we would, we would say, because there are relatively few changes, we would say this segment traces back to a time about 50,000 years ago. So that red blob there coincide, corresponds to the point at which these two DNA sequences were identical. And they've become different from one another in the intervening years by mutations causing these changes. So although this segment came from your mother and your father, the last time they shared a common ancestor genetically was 50,000 years ago. Okay. This segment over here has more changes. Okay. So I've drawn it down here just so that it fits onto the diagram. And so this segment will be older when we trace it back. And in fact, like many segments in your genome, it will trace back to a million years ago. 
So if we go this, so in other words, the last time the DNA, the one DNA segment that you got from your mother and the, the DNA segment you got from the father, the last time they were the same was about a million years ago. They've been, they've been separate from one another until they came together in you. Now that's not strictly true. They've, they've come together in lots of other individuals, but from your perspective, that's what your tree looks like for this particular segment of DNA, okay? So if you want to look at when these two things trace their ancestry back, they trace their ancestry back to an individual that lived a million years ago. And almost certainly living a million years ago, that meant they lived in Africa. And a million years ago, they weren't even Homo sapiens. So, and in fact, for the vast majority, so this is an outlier a million years ago, but for the vast majority of your genome segment, it's not as extreme as this and not as young as this. Most segments in your genome, if we do this sort of exercise, what we find is that they come to a common ancestor that lived in Africa about a thousand years ago. And you can make that statement about any two segments, the two segments in your, de in your genomes, the one segment from you compared to one segment from your neighbor, one segment from you compared to me. And you will arrive at about the same answer. And that's got nothing to do with whether you're European or not. It's only got to do with the fact whether you're alive today and you're a homo sapiens. Okay. So in other words, a significant fraction of your genome, not all, but but a significant fraction, the, the majority of your genome comes from a time when we lived in an environment that looked much like this. Okay, I'm sure you can recognize this as a, as a, as a part of the African landscape. We don't know where, and in fact, it's, it's likely we'll never be able to answer the question where in Africa Homo sapiens originated because again, as I think must be emerging, I hope is emerging from this picture I'm showing you, is that we're, 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 we're a mosaic of networks. Um, and so it's unlikely that there'll be a single, we'll ever be able to find a single orange point, a, a origin point that is localized for a specific geographical setting. So I said most of your bits of DNA come from people that lived, homo sapiens that lived in Africa about a thousand years ago, but not all. A very small fraction, if you're European, it'll be no more than 2%, but it can be slightly more if you come from other parts of the world. Share ancestry from these individuals. So this guy here is a reconstruction of a Neanderthal. Uh, this person or this person here is represented by a single tooth. Um, this, we don't have a good enough uh, fossil evidence, but we do have genetic information. One of the revolutions that's happened in the last 10 to 12 years is the ability to recover DNA from fossils like this tooth. And fossils like this tooth generated enough DNA that we could generate information and show that actually this is not a Neanderthal, it's not a Homo sapiens, but it's another group of individuals that we call the Denisovans. And both the Denisovans and, Homo Sap and the Neanderthals contributed significantly um, to our ancestry. So we know now that groups of individuals that migrated out of Africa, groups of Homo sapiens that migrated out of Africa about 60,000 years ago, when they came, when they moved out into a world, remember, this is a world that is glaciated or going through glaciations. Um, they encountered people that had gone, that had already, they were already inhabiting that area hundreds of thousands of years ago, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. And as Adam Rutherford has said, um, the thing that you can say about uh, people is, is they migrate. So Homo sapiens are very good at migrating large differences, distances, and they are also very keen on having sex with one another. And it's no surprise, therefore, that, that when these people encountered the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, they had children with them. And those children survived to have uh, their own children down to today, when again, as I said, if you have significant European ancestry, if you've done 23 and Ancestry.com, one of the things that they will have told you is what percentage of your genome contains Neanderthal DNA. <laughs> 
And that is the signature of these events that happened between 40 and 60,000 years ago. These guys are gone. By about 30, between 30 and 40,000 years ago, they had disappeared and they're only, they have only lived on in us. Okay. Which I think is both tragic, but also incredibly romantic as well at the same time. So migration and population mixture are the things that, if you, if you like, uh, uh, personified by the idea that we've inherited Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. But migration and population mixture is the thing that defines us more than anything else. Okay, it pulls the rug. So you, the more we have learned about human genetics, the more it's become apparent that our preconceived ideas about how you can divide people up into groups that we would call, for instance, races today, how that is undermined by modern genetics. It pulls the rug out from the idea that we can be divided into a handful of clearly delineated racial groups. As I'm going to show you for the remainder of this talk, nothing is stable when it comes to human ancestry across um, generational time. So all modern human populations that we're used to seeing today and used to talking about. So, you know, we might be taught, used to talking about South Asian populations or East Asian populations or, or even Han Chinese as a group. Those modern human populations, if you go back 10,000, possibly even 4,000 years ago, didn't exist. And the populations that existed at the time no longer exist. They only exist as ex uh, today as mixtures of events that happened in, the ancest in, in, their, in the an our ancestors. Populations that existed between four to 10,000 years ago no longer exist today in unmixed form. And that's an important outcome. Of, of these studies in, in archaic and, and um, archaeological DNA. So what I want to do is explain what I mean by this by focusing on specifically on the ancestry of Europe. Now, the story I'm going to tell you is perhaps as what most well defined for Europe. But as we're seeing, as people are doing studies, or in areas all around the world, the story is the same wherever you go, okay? But I'm going to tell you the story about Europe. So this is Cheddar Man, or rather, strictly speaking, this is a reconstruction of Cheddar Man. So he lived in what is now England about 14,000 years ago, and he's been reconstructed here from skeletal remains. But, but, but using these skeletal re remains a few years ago, a group of human geneticists sequenced his genetic code and they were able to use some of that genetic code so that we could make predictions about what, what his physical features that are important to us today, what they might look like. So for instance, we could say with some degree of certainty, there are some, there are, I don't want to make overplay this, but we can say with some degree of certainty that he would have had blue eyes this individual, and he would have had relatively dark skin and certainly dark hair. So there's some, there's some verisimilitude, verisimilitude about this reconstruction, but there is also some uncertainty. So I don't want to make, it, make the case that we have made this prediction bang on. Now, he and his people that lived about 14,000 years ago are a group of individuals that we would call the Western hunter-gatherers. Now, they have contributed a tiny amount to the modern people who are alive today with European ancestry. So you and me, if you have significant European ancestry as I do, then there will be a certain amount of, of DNA that you will have inherited from this guy's um, people, the Western hunter-gatherers. But European ancestry is a mixture of three major groups. Okay, so the first group, is this guy's people, the Western hunter-gatherers. Now, this is a, I want to take you through this because it's quite, quite a complicated presentation because obviously there's time going on here. What this is, is taking genetic evidence 
from ancestral studies from lots of different sites ac across Europe and color coding it based on geography according to what proportion of the individuals that were sampled living in different parts of the world of, the, of Europe at different times. That's what this number is here coming through to the present. So it starts off, it does move quite quickly, but it starts off at minus 1080. That's 10,000 years ago. So that's at the end of the last ice age, the beginning of what we call the Holocene. Now just let it cycle past you for a few times. So you see, if you look at the scale along here, very yellow means that nearly everybody alive at the time were what we would call Western hunter-gatherers, at least as we, as we understand it. Actually, I need to go back to get that to cycle again. Okay, so you watch it cycle backwards and forwards. You see as you can see a decline in Western hunter-gatherer so that today we don't see very strong signatures over time. So why is that? Well, the reason for that is because they were being replaced by European, early European fathers, farmers, moving out of Anatolia around about 7,600 years ago. You can see this pulse moving into Europe. And then that also seems to drop. And that pulse seems to drop around about 4,000, 4,500 years ago. So I think you can see what might be happening here. We've got an initial population, almost exclusively Western hunter-gatherers, which somehow gets replaced or something, some event is happening. We don't have to think about this as being violence. We don't have to think about this being an invasion. It could equally be dilution of, of the genetic code. So we can look at that in lots of different ways. And in fact, in some cases, we don't fully and fully know the reason, but we do know these movements. And so now obviously as well, we've also got to contend with the fact, okay, we see this pulse of early European farmers migrating in from Anatolia and bringing in agriculture with them as they go. But they also, this is, this is zero is today. They also seem to have largely gone. What, what makes up most of the people today then? So there's one other element that we need to bring in. And these are individuals. Uh, this is not, this simulation is not working for some reason. This is an individual, um, the, the group of individuals. Well, I, I'm not gonna try and get the, the animation working. Basically what you would see is you would see much like these other animations, you'd see a flow of individuals coming in um, and gradually, uh, taking over Europe, such as this is the position as it pertains today. So we have a gradient uh, of, of ancestry, but largely most of Europe consists of individuals which are a mixture of uh, small amounts of Western hunter-gatherer, slightly more amounts of uh, early European farmers that migrated in about 8,000 years ago, and then individuals that migrated in from the Eurasian steppe, so around the Black Sea, that area north of the Black Sea, migrated in, bringing with them wheeled chariots and various other things, but also with them the DNA that we can see, such that uh, a substantial proportion of modern Europeans uh, are composed of mixtures of the Amnaya, or that's what we call these Eurasian steppe people, these Anatolian farmers and Western hunter-gatherers. So this is what I mean by if you go back in time, you would not find. So, for instance, if we were to go back to 3000, 4000 years ago, you would not find people that we would characterize as modern Europeans. They didn't exist at that point in that form. What you would find would be the, the nascent mixtures that are occurring between uh, the European farmers uh, and the Yamnaya as they were coming in, these people from the steppe, going further back you would see a significant proportion of what we would recognize in modern Europeans as genetic material completely absent because far, far enough back, this migration hasn't happened. And even further back, so about 10,000 years ago, the people that lived in, Euro, uh, in Northern Europe 10,000 years ago had none of the traits that we would see in modern Europeans apart from the small amount that they have contributed. So this is an important uh, outcome of this. And we see this 
all across the planet. Okay, so the story that I've just told you um, is mirrored, but in by all over all, all over where you go. So this is a global view of humanity from the last sixty five thousand years or so, starting with an event, the migration out of Africa, um, which initiated the human settlement that I guess one of the last culminating events was the population of uh, the Americas by groups of individuals that migrated across the Bering Strait or, or tacked along the Bering Strait. And each one of these migration events tells a similar story. None of these, none of these migration events corresponds to people. So for instance, the event that happened 15,000 years ago, the, the peoples of today are, are different. OK, so there's there's a constant flux, a constant mixture of people. So I hope what I've demonstrated in this talk is that we're a young species. OK, we've we're really unusual in that we are a cosmopolitan mammalian species. Now, what I mean by that is that we've taken over the world. We live everywhere on the planet, pretty much. Um, if we look at another another mammal that, that does the same, so if we think about wolves, if we look at wolves, they're also cosmopolitan, but their genetic diversity is huge in comparison to ours. We have very, very limited genetic diversity, and most of the diversity that we share in common across the planet is the diversity that existed 60 to 65,000 years ago. Similar stories have, have happened in Africa since then as well. And there, I could, there's a whole other lecture I could give you about the, the patterns of flow and flux that have happened in Africa over the last 60,000 years. So don't focus, we don't, you shouldn't focus on the idea that migrations around the world are the only things that, that have causes, caused changes uh, and adaptations. That's, that's not true. Um, but the key thing that I want you to take home from this is that Although we've migrated these last these vast distances, we've kept in touch with one another. OK, so there is no case where you could pinpoint somebody and say, or oh, there are very, very few places. The only case might be the Andaman Islands, where you can say this group of individuals have been isolated from one another for 10,000 years and they've had no contact with other groups. That turns out to be much of a myth. There are greater, there are more, there are greater degrees of interaction than in certain areas than others. But the idea that we've been separated is simply not borne out by the genetic data. So the rea the reality is that the human gene pool is shallow, and if it were a real sign, if it were a real pool, it would need this warning sign. Okay. So I'll stop there. If you've enjoyed this talk and you want to find out more, because this has been a very, very rapid jump through a lot of very complex material, there's three books that I would recommend. OK, so Adam Rutherford uh, has produced this wonderful book that that presents all the details, really, that I don't have time to go in in a much in a really accessible way. A good companion to this, read this one first, a good companion to this would be David Reich's book, Who We Are and How We Got When. Now, David Reich is a, a researcher at Harvard. He, he's one of the labs that has pioneered the ability to sequence genetic code from individuals that lived tens, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago. Um, and he's, his lab has along with several others, has really revolutionized our understanding of who we are and how we got here. But it's quite a technical book, although it's a popular science book. I would read Adam's book first, and then maybe this one. And then a book that I can't recommend enough is Angela Saini's book, Superior, which looks at genetics from a cultural perspective. So why, ha why do we have this perception that there, we can group everybody on, on the planet into these very, a handful of groups uh, and, and to think that that has any biological relevance? And genetics shows very clearly that it doesn't. Um, and so I recommend that book as well. Right, so I'll stop there and I'll take any questions if there are any. Super, thank I'll you. To... Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm just kind of mind blown right. <laughs> after listening <laughs> to that. You.
Um, uh, so just a reminder, everybody, you can use the chat to ask questions. I think everyone's probably in the same boat as me. Um, just try to think it through and what they want to ask. And uh, we have got one to begin with. Um, so the first question is, first of all, it says absolutely fascinating, thank you. I believe a number of suppliers of DNA testing kits keep databases. Ancestry, yes. for example, said I've read in the USA, are there dangers in this? <laughs> um, that's, it depends on the dangers. So um, the reality is that, um, the databases are the databases maintained by 23andMe and Ancestry are very very secure. So I that they have um, they keep very tight reins on them. Occasionally they will make the information available, but it's it's very it's very anonymized. Now that said. Um, a number of researchers in the US have shown that you can potentially circumvent some of these issues. If you know enough about genetics, you can actually find out information about individual people. Probably not from 23andMe and Ancestry, because I don't think there's a way of doing it. But there is a publicly available and, uh, and Ancestry database called GEDmatch or GEDmatch. And in fact, that was, I don't know whether people have heard of this case. There was a, uh, uh, a, a very particularly nasty serial rapist and murderer who was operating in San Francisco in the Bay Area, who is currently, I think, awaiting conviction because they were able to use ancestry to track this person down. So you will, you, your, your DNA will illuminate all your relatives. If you put your DNA into a public site, not only are you revealing stuff about yourself, but you're revealing stuff about your, your relatives all the way out to your third or your fourth cousins. So it's worth bearing in mind, but I think 23andMe and Ancestry, you're probably safe. And, and just further on that, um, and obviously well, I'm into true crime and have read about that case. And do you think there's a risk of um, any of this information, even with big companies like 23andMe and Ancestry, being used with law enforcement against people's will or against their permission? It's an area that's, I mean, I'm not an expert in this area. I just keep up, keep up with it as, uh, as an interested party. Um, it's... So, for instance, in that particular case, the they were they they tracked down the third and fourth cousins of this individual, and they were able to narrow it down to two possible suspects. Now, so so I should say the reason why they were able to do this was was because somebody with foresight in the seventies froze some forensic material taken from one of the victims, so they were able to sequence DNA from that and upload it. And that's how they found these relatives. What they were then able to do is to get a court order, uh, if, if, if effectively a search warrant, allowing them to swipe DNA from coffee cups of suspects and sequence for the match. I think this is probably a case where the courts really need to catch up because I think there are some... I would worry that there could be convictions that were unsafe because they're technically unsafe and the, and the courts are not being advised. So this is a case, this is a case where possibly we need geneticists acting in a professor, professional capacity. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's no other questions in the chat at the moment, but I've, I've got one that just uh, purely out of interest. Um, when there's you know, sort of common serious illnesses, incurable illnesses, things like, um, you know, uh, Parkinson's or uh, dementia, that kind of thing. Yeah. Are geneticists able to map when that first became an, a thing, became a, 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 a disease? And is it, I know nothing about them, so is it something that's always passed genetically or is that's, it something that can be developed? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. And, and yes, yes, we are. Um, so um, 
just using the techniques that I, I, I explained about, yes, we, we can date specific parts of, of DNA. And so we can, we can do that, yes, so we can see. So for instance, we know, and what's, what's nice is as, as well as dating that theoretically from modern sequences, we've now got the ability that we can just go back to fossil material or not just fossil, but historical material and say, well, can we see that? And in fact, that's, that's what we see. So you can, so cystic fibrosis, for instance, we can date that to um, within cer certain degrees. We know that that's happened in the last, uh, for certain genetic variants of cystic fibrosis, we know that they're slightly more than 10,000 years old. For, for things associated with malaria resistance, we know that they're actually less than 10,000 years old. Um, so some things are a complete surprise. Um, the, the, the region of the human genome that has been subject to the strongest selection pressure is the ability to drink milk as an adult. Um, and we thought early on when people were doing these studies, we thought that that meant that um, sometime a long, long time ago, that was subject, that, you know, that, that's when it became an important feature of our diets. That's not true at all. It's only happened in the last 2000 years. Oh, yeah, it's remarkable. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. Um, yeah. The next question is, where do you see DNA research moving in the future? From an outside perspective, it feels that research in this area is evolving so quickly. Yes. So, I mean, we are, some things, some things are faster than we ever expected that they would be, uh, and, and other things are being oversold. So, I mean, I think one of the classic one is I did not expect a few years ago when this new technique called uh, uh, CRISPR genome engineering came out. We, we use it in the laboratory on our worms. Um, and that was in 2015. I did not expect that within five years, somebody would be doing that in people. <laughs> Now, now that now that person um, went against all of the ethical approvals, and um, it's a, that was an awful, awful set of circumstances. So that's the case of it moving way faster than we were we ever expected, um, and it was a completely unnecessary intervention as well. Um, I I think the areas. So if you want me to go out on a limb. I suspect that some of the things that we will start to see will could well be, um, if, you, if you like, pe 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 people people possibly trying to make improvements. Now, I it, it it can't happen under the current regulatory environment. I can't see it happening, but I would not put it past some rogue element doing that. Curing disease, I'm less, I'm more sanguine about. We already have the ability to do in vitro fertilization and screen embryos if we suspect that there might be genetic disease in the family. We don't need to do you know, expensive genome engineering techniques. We can just screen the embryos and look for the ones that, that, that don't have the damaged genes. And I would, I, I, I am, I'm nervous about the idea of doing any intervention in the human genome because my feeling is that we don't understand it well enough. The idea of engineering babies for high IQ, you know, never say never, but I can't see that happening. Our understanding of the system is not good enough. Okay, the next question is, um, do you think more care should be taken when these commercially available tests may provide clinical information that's possible disease development in a family? Yeah, I think one of the problems is, so I said at the beginning, these people are not, the, the companies are not presenting bad science. Okay, they are, but the problem is that the science is, you would have to have a good understanding of the genetics sometimes. So, so for instance, the earwax thing that I started with, that's fine. It, it's, it's one of the few things that if you have that particular genetic signature, you will have wet earwax or you will have dry earwax and it has no real consequences anyway. There, there are cases where as well, so for instance, BRCA mutations, things associated with breast cancer, we, ha we know for some mutations, the risk is well-defined. And I suspect the companies would do due diligence on that. But it's areas with things like cardiovascular disease, what we call complex genetics, 
where the risks where we don't really understand enough about the medical genetics side of things. OK, we, we we can define that there is a risk associated with one particular population that we did out. We did the study on, but that those risks don't transfer well to other populations. And I'm not here. I'm not talking about whether you're European. We know that there are cases where if you study a group of people that live in a certain area. And do this, do the tests, those tests are not applicable to the same ancestral group but living in another area. So it, that aspect is complicated. And I think to be fair to them, I think they do a quite a good job at, at, at presenting the uncertainty. But it's actually hard to do anyway, to, to explain that. So yeah, I think there are risks. Super, thank you. And just something that you mentioned about ethics earlier and somebody kind of going against all uh, advice to, to, to um, you know, discover something. What's your stance on that? You know, do you, are you behind people being a little bit more rogue if it's for the greater good or or do you think oh, that gosh, no, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine a situation where you would go against uh, the regulation that I mean there are global regulations but there are also UK wide regulations and uh, I cannot imagine the situation where you would go against those regulations on the grounds that it would be good for people because it simply wouldn't be. I, my feeling is, I mean, we we used to have somebody in Aberdeen, uh, Neva Haites, who was who was very active in the ethical regulation. And, uh, you know, I, I, speaking to her, it's very clear that, that, that the regulations are there for good reason. Um, and as we, we've seen, um, I, I cannot think of a situation where it would be for the greater good for humanity to contravene the current regulations that we have. Good, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and just finally on that topic, um, are there any significant regulatory differences between different countries? Oh, that's an area that I that I suspect there are, but I, but it may be. So, for instance, in it's, the, the regulatory environment is difficult because in the US, there are certain things that you can do in private organizations that you can't do in federally funded organizations. So that's a kind of a distinction. Whereas in the UK, there's a, just a blanket ruling. So that's some things. Some things are more allowable in, in, in the UK law, right? So, so for instance, there is license to, to use embryo, human embryos, the, the byproducts of um, in vitro fertilization regimes because there will always be this embryos that for whatever reason are not developing normally and it would be absolutely ethically dodgy to 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 implant them so you you either destroy them um, and and there are limited very very limited licenses in the UK which allow you to study them and they're not allowed to be taken to term and all, or obviously not allowed to be taken to term and so forth so there are differences yes mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough about comparisons across everywhere though. Okay, thank you. And we said another question pop up which says the commercial tests go into quite a lot of detail about how much ancestry you supposedly have from individual countries. How reliable or otherwise is yeah. that? I'm inclined to be skeptical, but that's more gut mistrust of precision than anything. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad somebody asked that question. I, I did think about having a slide about it, but I mean, it, to be honest, I, I thought uh, I, it would it would diverse things, but so I hope somebody would ask this question. That's very good. So what they're doing when they do that is they're looking in their database and they're saying all the different genetic variants. Remember, on average, you'll have one every thousand letters in your code. Um, all of these different variants, they're saying all of the other people who've sent sent in this data and all of the other data that we have access to from people. Where do the people live that look most like you? And so that question is, where do the people live today that look most like you? So while they're writing it as ancestry, it, it isn't. It may be now. I haven't kept up with it. Maybe 23andMe um, and, and the other companies. It may be that they also include some of these uh, historical samples in it, in which case, you know, maybe. But the thing is, going back 10,000 years is so far back that you won't be distinguishable from somebody else that lives in Europe compared to your relationship to, say, Cheddar Man, for instance. We're all the same. 
Um, so, but yeah, so when somebody says you're, I don't know, uh, 2% Irish, right? What that's saying is that 2% um, of your genetic variation is shared with people who live currently today in Ireland and have shared their genetic code with 23andMe in some way. That's what that's saying. That's really interesting. I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, okay, I think that could be all. You've still got a couple more minutes, yep. everyone. If you've got anything else, you can just get it typed in right now. Um, Chloe's saying that's interesting as well, because I didn't realize. I, I was naively assuming it was some sort of <laughs> historical I, I data. Think... I think if you read if you read what they what they if you read the detail they they make that clear. I, the, one thing I would say about them is that I that I don't think there's anything dodgy about a company like Twenty Three and Me are very much above board. They are telling you the science. It's just that sometimes they're not. They're, I mean, I think they do take a lot of care to try and not mislead try to not mislead people. But I think obviously at the same time, they also want to have a product which is easy to read and easy to understand. And there's a balance to be built. Yeah, absolutely. Right, I think that's everybody. So I think that just yep. uh, leaves me to say thank you so much for spending well, time with us. Been. It's been absolutely fascinating. I'll be thinking about this all evening now and talking to everyone <laughs> about it. <laughs> and um, yeah, so thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's taken the time to join us as well. Um, we will be uploading a recording so you can watch it again if you want to later. Right. So thank you again. Thank Thanks you everyone. Have a nice evening. Okay.